Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this conference. It's 11 sharp, so we are going to slowly uh, start uh, our conference. Um, so welcome um, to the future of citizen science, sharing experiences from the European community. Uh, my name is Marzia Mazzonetto, and together with my colleague Michael Creek, uh, we will be the conference facilitators today and tomorrow. Um, it is a pleasure for us to be here uh, with you today. Uh, thank you for uh, joining. Um, and uh, we will uh, be taking you through the different sessions uh, and activities that will be happening throughout these two days. Uh, both uh, Michael and me work at Sticky Dot. Sticky Dot is a Brussels-based collective dedicated to supporting citizen engagement with science uh, through co-creation and participatory approaches. Um, as you probably know, this conference is jointly organized by two projects funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 work program. Uh, one project is called ACTION, and it is a project focused on supporting citizen science initiatives addressing various types of pollution. Uh, the support that ACTION has provided to citizen science projects uh, ranges from, uh, for example, an accel accelerator program to several tools and methods and guidelines. Uh, and all this huge richness of outcomes uh, is now available uh, and will be shared with the community. Uh, the second project is called eucitizen.science uh, and it has built uh, an amazing online platform that brings together and supports the European citizen science community and beyond. On the eucitizen science platform, it is possible to find training courses, uh, a lot of uh, very interesting resources and plenty of inspiring citizen science projects. Uh, it actually brings together several European countries, and you will hear from many of them uh, throughout these days. Uh, and these countries are actually becoming more and more engaged in citizen science activities and support. Uh, these two projects are actually going to end soon. Uh, they have almost come to, to their end, and, and actually this conference represents for both of them uh, a great opportunity to share their experience with the community at large. So uh, both projects are really glad uh, to know that you're joining today and they will do their best to share uh, their uh, experiences with all of you. Uh, throughout these two days, there will be several sessions uh, where we will hear about their experience and we will discuss together, we will talk together about their legacy. Um, you will be able to meet several of the project partners uh, and learn from their experience, uh, talk to them, exchange with them, uh, but also uh, debate about the future of citizen science in the European context with invited guests. And I know this is a topic that uh, is very important uh, to all of us. So thank you very much again for being here with us today, and we really hope that you will enjoy this conference very much. Uh, now my colleague Michael uh, will take us through some housekeeping tips uh, on how to exploit this uh, great platform that we are using today called Hopin. Of course, as you can imagine, for obvious reasons, we were not able to hold this conference in person, but we hope you will enjoy the experience that we will be able to provide to you through Hopin. Uh, he will also give an overview of the agenda and also other practical information. So I hand over to you, Michael. Thanks very much, Marzia. A real pleasure uh, to be joining all of you today. It's great to see, I was scrolling through uh, to see some familiar faces as well as uh, some new faces in the chat. It's a real pleasure uh, to see all of you and we're really looking forward to some uh, dynamic discussions uh, today. Let's have a look at the agenda for today. So in just a moment, uh, we'll be introducing uh, Patrick Brunier uh, from DG Research uh, for some opening words. 
And uh, we'll then go straight on to hear from the two initiatives that uh, Matia mentioned, Action and EU Citizen Science. Uh, at 12 o'clock, our session will look at sharing knowledge for empowering citizen science. This is a session focusing on tools and resources and how to make the most of them. At one o'clock, we'll break for lunch, but you're welcome to stay with us uh, in a social room or for some networking, and we'll explain how that works in just a moment. And at two, uh, we'll open our exhibition space. Uh, you'll be able to uh, discover some new citizen science projects and initiatives there. Uh, at three o'clock, we come back here to the main stage uh, for our session with a focus on societal transformation. And at uh, 10 past four, uh, we'll wrap up back here on the main stage. Um, so a bit about the uh, different conference areas uh, that you'll find. Um, so you'll notice on the left uh, in the column, you have the options stage where we are now and sessions just below. So these are where our sessions will take place and we'll be directing you towards one or the other. Uh, most of them will happen here on the stage. Uh, you'll also see a little bit lower down, uh, you see stage, then sessions, then networking, and then expo. So that's where at two o'clock uh, today, um, you'll be able to discover our booths, our virtual booths, um, to hear about some projects and initiatives in the community. Uh, just above Expo is our networking area. So this will open up during lunch and coffee breaks. And this is a chance to be paired up with another conference participant. Uh, you are leaving it up to fate <laughs> as to who you will be paired with. Um, it's completely arbitrary, but it will be only conference participants. Um, so anytime you feel like a little chat, uh, a random encounter, uh, you can click networking and join. And the system will match you up uh, with a conversation partner. You can also leave at any time. If, if the conversation gets awkward, <laughs> it's no problem to leave. Um, then uh, what other areas do I need to tell you about? Ah, yeah, so at lunchtime and during the coffee breaks, if you go to sessions, you will also see our social room. Um, so here you'll be able to uh, share video and audio and join a social conversation uh, around the lunch table or the coffee table, uh, depending on when it is. Uh, so yeah, that's in sessions. Um, so you should also know that uh, you can see who's here looking at the people tab. So this you'll see on the right of your screen. Um, and you can use that tab to schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings at any moment with anyone. Uh, if you schedule a meeting, that will pop up in my events that you can also see in the tab on the right. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate to use Hopin to schedule these one-on-one -on -one meetings and you can have a video chat within the platform itself. And of course, you can message people directly, send private messages uh, as you'll, you'll have found the uh, stage chat um, where we are at the moment, uh, where you've been letting us know where, where you're calling in from. Um, but there's also private chat options, so you can send messages to individual participants. Tomorrow, uh, we have our uh, satellite high-level policy event uh, taking place. That's from 2 till 4, so directly after the sessions close here. Um, if you're having any technical issues, uh, you're struggling to find your way around, you're a little bit lost in hopping, uh, you can find Andrea Nicolai. Have a look in people and search for Andrea and you will find uh, Andrea Nicolai. Please don't hesitate to send them a message if there's anything you're struggling with. Uh, we're live tweeting this um, using the hashtag uh, future of CS 2021. So please don't hesitate uh, to use the hashtag yourself. You can follow us at action for CS and at EU sit sci project. Um, so please do join in the conversation on Twitter and keep it all going there. Um, so that's everything uh, in terms of the practical questions. Uh, let me hand back over to Marcia to break the ice. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. So before we go into the core of today's sessions, uh, we have planned uh, a few fun activities with you uh, to both uh, wake you up in case you haven't had enough coffee yet, 
uh, but also to uh, try and get to know you a little bit. Of course, it's very difficult in an online environment, but we will really do our best uh, to have a little uh, exchange with you before uh, we go into the first session. Yeah, so, we you know, without an icebreaker, right? Of course. <laughs> so, uh, to do so, we are going to use uh, a few features that uh, Hopin has, one of them being polls. So my uh, colleagues uh, in the backstage, there is a very complex system behind what you are seeing right now being streamed, uh, are going to activate some polls which will be appearing uh, and there will be some really difficult questions that we will be asking you. So the first question is going to appear really soon and is about coffee. So we would really like to know uh, whether you have had more than two coffees today. Uh, Straight into the important questions. Indeed. It's already 11 a.m., well, at least where we are in Brussels. So probably, <laughs> at least I have had already <laughs> more than two coffees. Let's see how many um, participants have also had um, more than two coffees today. So answers are pretty easy, yes or no. Okay, I was imagining it was going to be an absolute landslide for yes on this. But Interesting. Looking, uh, people have been taking it easy this morning. Indeed. I well, we we had made not bets but sort of uh, forecasts before the conference, and we were pretty sure that the yes would win. Uh, maybe by these are tea because uh, tea. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we should have another question. Yeah, about tea. Okay, then a second question, really difficult one, and we really, really hope you will answer, you will be very honest when answering it. Uh, the second question is, are you still wearing your pyjamas? And please answer yes, even if you're only wearing half of your pyjama, that counts. I see some answers popping up in the chat as well. If you uh, look next to the chat tab, you have the polls tab. There should be a little red dot popping up there where you can uh, answer the question. Yes, don't hesitate to let us know in the chat if you are having any issue, but I see 14.6% of very honest participants who have told us that, yes, there's you're wearing your pyjama. Wow. No worries, yes, that we won't, uh, you won't have the opportunity to switch your cameras on until the afternoon, so you have plenty of time to change into clothes. Yeah, we'll be checking. Indeed. Yeah. And a fair 8% is still asleep. So, uh, yes, we will have, we'll, we'll keep going with some fun activities. So, hopefully, by the time we end this icebreaker, you will be fully awake for the first presentation. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. But the power of uh, this community that they can still connect to the conference while fast asleep and in the pajamas. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, for the next uh, warm up question, We'd like you to come back to the chat tab. And uh, this time, I'm going to ask you just to type your answer directly in the chat. Uh, this is my nosy question uh, of what can you see out of your window? So if you have a window, have a quick look out and type in the chat to let us know what's going on out there. Are your neighbors arguing? Are the pigeons arguing? In the meantime, I'm seeing in the chat that um, someone has already been swimming this morning, so fully awake, and someone is connected from Rio de Janeiro, where it's really early in the morning, so thank you for, for joining us from Brazil. Impressive. Yeah, some people still getting dressed on autopilot while fast asleep. Indeed, it's very possible to be dressed but still asleep. Okay, so we have some, some trees, some rain. Mountains, some of sunshine, yeah, okay. Don't rub it in. Not in Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Ah, oh, some nice views. Wow. Yeah, some coots swimming on the pond. Ah, oh, some autumn colors, nice. Rotterdam, can you actually see the windmills directly from your window? I'm, I'm very impressed. Oh, and the sugar loaf. Wow. <sighs> Yeah, these are a lot more exciting than, <laughs> than I imagined. <laughs> ah, yeah, some windows cleaner than others as well. Well done for admitting. 
Ah, lovely. Greece also sounds very nice. Yeah, gosh, places we would have liked to have met, to have met, to have met up for this uh, for this conference. And if Jan has bunnies hopping past the window, I'm not sure how much I believe all of, all of these answers, but thank you very much for uh, sharing with us. Maybe there are bunnies in the garden. Um, my next question, getting back on track a little bit, uh, what are your expectations of today's event? And again, please type in the chat to let us know. What are you hoping to get out of uh, our conference over these two days? <laughs> Joe, let's hope your neighbors can uh, at least see your screen and join in the conference a little bit. Ah, it's your rabbit, okay. Yeah, let us know your expectations uh, to type in the chat. Would be great. Uh, looking for inspiration? Yeah, this we will definitely have in the, uh, well, throughout the sessions, but also in the expo area. New initiatives popping up. Oh, you're getting some likes on that comment. I think there's lots of people agreeing. Yeah, what is the future of citizen science? That's a really good question that we are going to address in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, we will fully answer this. <laughs> of course. No entirely. <laughs> no pressure on the speakers. Our crystal balls already. Ah, sense of new beginnings. I like this. Yeah. Yeah, hearing about these projects, learning what's going on. Networking, yep. Yeah. So you're ready, Marie, to get paired up in the uh, in the networking space. Pretty. Looking for enlightenment. Wow, it's getting very philosophical at uh, very early in the morning. Great. Well, we hope to give you uh, this chance to reconnect with each other, uh, with the various initiatives going on. And yes, this chance to look to the future a little bit, um, to picture where things are going with citizen science uh, in the coming years. Yeah, thank you very much all for, uh, for joining in our little icebreaker. It's been uh, good, good to hear from all of you. So we have one very last poll before we invite our last, uh, our first speaker uh, to join us. Um, so I hope my colleague is ready to make it appear. Uh, the question is about what is your experience with citizen science? This is will be very helpful to us also to um, get to know a little bit uh, and understand how experienced you are uh, with citizen science. Uh, it will be uh, very helpful for our upcoming activities to know how, um, yeah, how to present citizen science to you and our experience. Let's see. Okay. You can find that again in the polls tab. So just next to the chat. And I see that some of you are already voting. So we asked whether you're just starting out, some experience or lots of experience. And I see most of you so far have some, but it's fairly, it's fairly even. And yeah, in the sense, there should be a little for everyone. If you're just starting out, I hope uh, you can find some inspiration as well for the types of projects you'd like to be working on. Yeah, it's a quite fair spread, I would say. Um, I think Many of you already have at least some experience, but we also have some participants just starting out. And I think you are definitely in the right place as we will be sharing plenty of resources that can get you um, really very quickly familiar with some key aspects of citizen science. Okay, then, uh, thank you very much uh, for having joined this, this icebreaker with us. Uh, I think uh, we are right on time to start with our first uh, session for today. So I'm going to invite our first speaker uh, on the stage uh, with me. His name is Patrick Grenier. Uh, he's advisor for the European Research Area and Open Science at the European Commission's DG Research and Innovation. Welcome, Patrick, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Marcia. You are hearing me well, I suppose. Yes. 
Good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's very exciting to be joining this um, this conference, uh, both on the content and also on uh, the way it is being organized. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, this little uh, uh, warming up session. Um, I would like to maybe kick off this conference with a few messages um, on the side of the Commission um, to put things a bit in perspective. The first message is that citizen science is an activity that is booming and flourishing and that it is fully recognized. And we, we really have to uh, realize that it has taken off really in the last few years. Uh, we have seen the establishment of a lot of associations, uh, new policy trends and many, many new projects. And in just a few years, we've gone from a situation where uh, we were demonstrating or trying to demonstrate that citizen science can bring value to a situation where we're promoting citizen science as one of the means by which research and innovation delivers solutions to the many challenges that are in front of us. So none of this could have happened without dedicated work from a lot of people, the general public, which has given time and effort to various science-related activities the work of citizen science practitioners themselves that made that possible, and possibly, I would say, also the support of the European Commission. So that brings me to my second message. The European Commission will continue and mainstream its support to citizen science. So we've been encouraging uh, societally engaged research, such as citizen science, for many years now. It was actually one of the eight priorities of the first European Open Science Agenda back in 2015, alongside other very important objectives, such as open access and better system for assessing research. It was a key component of the SWAFs part of Horizon 2020, Science with and for Society, which supported uh, the EU citizen science platform which allowed to explore the potentials of citizen science, strengthen its practice through projects covering a broad area of uh, scientific areas, public health, frontier physics, and many more, by sharing resources, tools, and training. Now we are we've moved to Horizon Europe, as you know. And with Horizon Europe, we will go even further by encouraging societal engagement and citizen science across all parts of the program as an open science practice that will be evaluated under the methodology of the excellence criterion. It's a bit technical, but basically that means that when we will be evaluating the projects that the proposals that we received uh, through our calls for proposals, um, open science will be a criterion being evaluated by the evaluators. So very concretely, societal engagement is currently being mainstreamed in pillar two of Horizon Europe, which is the biggest of the pillars. This is where you find the six societal clusters, health, energy, etc., and the five new missions of Horizon Europe. And all that uh, accounts for more than half of the total budget of Horizon Europe. So mainstreaming of societal engagement across Pillar 2. And it is our uh, preliminary analysis, uh, looking at the first work program, 2021-2022, that the societal engagement is much, much more prominent than it was under the late years of Horizon 2020. In some of the clusters, in particular the agricultural environmental cluster, more than 50% of the topics which are in the work program recommend or mandate societal engagement practices. Furthermore, to, to monitor and drive home the importance of citizen science, we have included it in one of the nine impact pathways that will be used to assess the impact of Horizon Europe. So basically these are, the impact pathways are sets of indicators and, and analysis that allow to track the impact on the short, medium and long term of, um, of, of our investments. So the fact that 
uh, citizen science and societal engagement are now part of the impact pathway is a very concrete uh, means to ensure that it will be uh, reflected in, in the work that we fund. So finally, under um, a, a part of the work program, which is about strengthening the European research area, we have already included two topics on citizen science and several others to promote societal engagement as institutional change. And there will be more in, in the next work program 2022-2023. So that brings me to my third message. It's about the importance of opening research performing organizations to society. So in Horizon 2020, um, considerable efforts were put into supporting the research funding and research performing organizations to open up to society. And we have achieved impressive things through dedicated projects focused on institutional change. And we will continue through Horizon Europe. However, only so much can be achieved through EU financial support for societal engagement. More fundamental changes are needed in the European research and innovation systems, national policies and institutions. This is why the Commission has increasingly encouraged research institutions, such as universities, to interact with society and become enabling environments for societal for citizen science and societal engagement. And this will be reflected in the upcoming communication of the Commission on a strategy for European universities that should be adopted uh, in the very uh, few weeks, next first weeks of uh, next year. My fourth and last message is about the European research area that will make citizen science a recognizable, rewardable, and fundable mode of research and innovation. The new European research area, and I refer you to the communication of last September uh, 2020, 2020, and the new pact for research and innovation in Europe that will be adopted uh, this Friday by the Council, highlight the key role of engagement of, of citizens, local communities, and civil society at large to achieve greater societal impact and increased trust in science. There are, particular, there are two particular lines of activity that we'd like to bring to your attention. So the, the first line of activity concerns the launch of a European-wide citizen science campaign, which will be organized around Horizon Europe missions, starting with the Plastic Pirate campaign. And this, for us, represents a big opportunity to scale up citizen science, raise its profile further, and open up, open up science to the general public. The second line of activity, which I touched upon, is the reform of the research assessment system, which has so far, as you know, focused too much on publishing and not enough on open collaboration with knowledge actors such as citizens. So this is for us a fundamental reform that will help remove a major stumbling block to citizen science being a mainstream practice of open science. And you can expect as well uh, quite a few initiatives uh, starting already uh, next year through an alliance of uh, the willing to uh, experiment with new ways of uh, assessing researchers and, and research. So in closing, uh, the shift towards more inclusive and collaborative research and innovation systems represents clearly a challenge for us. It represents a challenge for uh, research and innovation actors, for institutions, for policymakers and funders, and uh, for citizen science community as well. So first, uh, we think it requires the expertise developed in citizen science projects to be spread to new partners, new projects, and new areas of scientific and innovation inquiry. And I think your conference is going to do quite a lot of that uh, in this direction. The second, we think it requires continued changes to the governance of research funding and performing organizations, including universities, building on what we have already learned on how to implement sustainable institutional changes. Here, you can expect more um, views from the Commission 
in this communication on the strategy for European universities beginning of next year. And finally, we think it requires us to help co-organize European-wide citizen science campaigns that raise awareness of important issues while doing excellent science at the same time. So I hope I have not uh, broken uh, the mood that was set by this very nice uh, uh, icebreaker uh, at the start. I wish you an excellent work during this inspiring conference, which will undoubtedly, undoubtedly help advance our common project of a better functioning European research area with stronger engagement of society and all citizens. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was a really interesting presentation and some really interesting uh, challenges and initiatives uh, coming up. I think the over 140 participants who have joined us uh, this morning um, have been uh, definitely inspired by uh, your presentation. Uh, I think we have maybe just a few seconds for just one question from the audience. Uh, there is quite some interest about whether there will be some statistics or some kind of monitoring about how many uh, proposals or in general how much science will citizen science will be more present uh, in projects and in approaches across the societal challenges. Um, in case you have any answer to this in just a few seconds, we would be really happy to, to hear. All right, very, very, very quickly. So we will continue supporting through um, two avenues. The first avenue is very much um, a continuation of the projects like under SWAFs. It will not be under uh, something called SWAFs anymore. It will be under something called Strengthening the European Research Area. And there are already two topics open and there will be more topics open in uh, further work programs. But the other big avenue, which is quite novel, is that as you know, we have always been using the framework program as a way to test and experiment what we think is good policy. We've done that with open access, we're doing this with open data, and now we're doing it uh, with open science. So open science, including citizen science, societal engagement, are fundable activities under the new uh, framework program. And in many cases, 50% of the cases under the cluster on agriculture and environment, the topics themselves actually recommend or mandate that the proposals include activities on citizen science or societal engagement. So this is what we call mainstreaming of citizen science and societal engagement across the different projects. And we think that when a policy becomes mature, it style it still needs to be supported specifically, but it needs to be uh, something that becomes an option or a feature that uh, belongs to any kind of research, not only specific topics or clusters of, of research. Uh, and there will be continued money. And I answer a last, um, a last comment I see, when will the citizen science campaign start? Well, this is uh, in the uh, ERA policy agenda that will be adopted on Friday by the Council. There is an action that says that we will be doing this. We have three years to do it. Uh, so it will start, uh, the preparation will start uh, certainly next year. And I don't know if the citizen science campaign will start still next year or the year after. That's great. Thank you very much, Patrick. And we look forward to, to all these uh, future opportunities. And thank you very much for explaining them to us so clearly today. Uh, you're welcome to join the, 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 the stage and the group of participants again. So uh, maybe the conversation will uh, keep going on uh, in the chat. Uh, but right now, I would like to uh, move on to uh, the next session and the next speaker for today. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Patrick Brenier, for, for joining us today. My pleasure. So uh, we are now going into uh, getting to know better uh, the two projects who are hosting 
uh, the conference uh, that is taking place today, so action and EU citizen science. Uh, the first presentation that we will hear is from the action project. So I would like to invite uh, to the stage uh, Elena Simper, uh, who is the coordinator of the action project and professor of computer science at King's College in London in UK. So welcome, Elena. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And we look forward to uh, hear about uh, action, uh, the lessons learned and the way ahead. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, it's a bit of a slow start for me today. Um, it's been an incredible journey to um, get to today and see so many of you here. Um, I have played perhaps the smallest share in the organization of the event. In fact, as you can see here on the slide from the previous poll, I was one of those seven people who felt that um, still asleep, uh, but things have improved actually. Uh, once I've heard Patrick speaking, um, so so that's all right. I uh, most of the most of the work in action to deliver this fantastic program um, has been done by um, the colleagues at uh, T six in Italy, Antonella Passani, uh, Katia Fieros, and, and and the rest of the team. So the um, thanks should 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 go to them. Um, let me tell you a little bit about action, though. Um, so this has been a uh, program um, funded under SWAFs uh, in Horizon 2020. Um, the project was uh, three years and is going to um, complete um, at the end of January 2021. Uh, we set out to deliver um, resources and toolkits um, to facilitate participatory science um, in a particular area with a particular challenge, and that is to fight various forms of, of pollution in Europe and the world. Um, and from a methodology point of view, um, we um, wanted to focus on several specific challenges, um, inclusivity, impact, and um, diversity across um, project life cycle. So recognizing um, that a citizen science initiative has varied needs and that these needs evolve as um, the project advances. We um, clustered our work into four areas. Um, so the toolkit, which comprises co-designed methodologies and socio-technical tools um, that are meant to simplify the everyday life of citizen science projects and to support their sustainability. And there we're drawing from our own experience, um, but we're also as much as possible um, trying to um, integrate uh, resources and, and experience reports from the wider community. So um, this is a screenshot of the toolkit as it is presented um, on the website. Um, and highlighted on a slide is also um, an area we have on the website where we are seeking out feedback. So um, if you are interested or if you can contribute resources um, and experiences and tools um, that are relevant to the citizen science, the participatory science um, life cycle that can support scientific problem framing or the implementation of the work or methods to think and, and assess and monitor impact and sustainability um, and engage with policymakers, get in touch with us um, and, and would love for, for this resource to um, really reflect the range of, of experiences and, 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 and solutions available um, in the European community. The second component of the program was the action accelerator. Um, you see, I have a computer science background. I have worked in open data and in data-driven innovation. Um, and in a previous life, I've also helped delivered publicly funded um, incubators and accelerators for 
um, data and AI startups. Um, so some of that experience, my own experience, uh, has, has, has informed this um, alongside um, the experience of the of the rest of the team in citizen science and and, and social innovation, and um, so we put together a six months framework um, with funding, with support, with training and mentoring to accelerate citizen science initiatives, um, and we were very keen to um, tailor our services um, for different types of projects both the ones that are just starting out and, and the ones that perhaps are already established and need very specific types of resources and support to achieve sustainability. We have worked together with 16 citizen science pilots uh, tackling different types of, of, of pollution over three cohorts between 2019 and 2021. Um, the first cohort uh, helped us co-design action as a whole, so they were already part of the consortium, um, and the remaining ones joined um, through uh, two open calls um, where we received, um, I think, around 120 submissions um, from um, all over Europe and, 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 and the world. And we have selected really 10 excellent pilots um, with which we had the privilege to, to work throughout the project. So if you are interested in how the Accelerator framework works, if you would want to apply it to your own settings, or if you would like advice or, or, or help on, on, on that, would be more than happy to, to do so. There are several other colleagues who will be present throughout the day uh, today and tomorrow, uh, Gefi Antwerma, Oscar Corcho, Antonella Pasani, and, and, and several others. The pilots themselves, and we've collected this information in a dashboard, uh, so I've mentioned already there are 16 of them. Um, they've reached out to more than 7,800 7, people. Um, you can have a look at the dashboard to see the different types of, of pollution state they address, so quite a broad range. More than 840 people actively involved in, in, in collecting data and analyzing it and um, uh, providing feedback to processes and methodologies. Um, a range of impacts as well. Um, so uh, Patrick mentioned earlier, um, how the New Horizon Europe program is designed to uh, make citizen science as a, as a methodology, as a method, uh, mainstream to uh, research, research and innovation, and that a lot of those activities uh, is concentrated in uh, at the pillar that deals with societal challenges. Um, this is something that, you know, is music to our ears. Part of our work in action has been uh, not just to help pilots uh, think about their impact, in particular their impact uh, on society and the environment, but also starting to think broadly about the types of methodologies one could come up with to use and reuse the data that is generated um, by the citizens with the help of the citizens um, um, in alignment with other efforts to contribute towards sustainable development goals and, and the European Green Deal. Um, and finally, the, the fourth uh, pillar um, of, of our program have been the policy masterclasses. And you've already heard that um, there will be one um, tomorrow happening just after we close uh, the conference. We've run um, five others um, in the Netherlands, in Norway, in the UK, in Spain and Italy with a cross-cutting theme to put citizen science on the national and regional policy agenda um, of, um, of different public administration, governmental agencies and policymakers across Europe, um, and conversely, to put policy impact on the agenda of citizen science as well. And these are, uh, this is just a preview of the policy recommendations um, uh, that came up of these uh, five uh, national engagements, which will be discussed uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon. Let me just conclude by um, giving you a summary of the lessons we have learned in the project um, and the way ahead, um, complementing what Patrick said um, earlier about um, citizen science as part of the um, research and innovation um, and policy instruments that the Commission is um, already implementing or planning to implement. 
So from our own experience in three years of action, we have clearly seen that there is a huge demand for programs like ours that provide an acceleration program, including funding, to support a different range of citizen science initiatives. We have received, so I said 120 applications, we received 194 applications. Um, and we've conducted interviews and we've established an action a process um, to run these sort of open calls um, in an efficient way um, so as to use public money um, in um, in a way that is that that delivers value, but also in a fair and and and, and transparent way. Um, we've received applications covering as many as fourteen different types of pollution. So that also gives you an idea of the range of issues, of challenges, and of potential solutions um, in this um, uh, time that we that we uh, live in. 31 different countries as well. So that tells you something about uh, the, uh, the landscape um, and the universality of these challenges and, 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 and approaches. And as I said earlier, we selected 10 of such projects. At the same time, we have experienced and we have clear evidence that citizen science requires a lot of support. This is just the back of an envelope calculation, but as it stands right now, for every euro that we spend doing citizen science, we have invested three years, euros in support services. So that puts some of that idea of mainstreaming citizen science in perspective, we believe. Um, so while it is encouraging to see that citizen science is increasingly recognized. We also have to acknowledge that there is a need to continue to streamline the support services. And we have done so. Um, we have created deficiencies by the use of digital tools, by the use of remote working, and we have used data in the way we have um, designed the program and made decisions. Um, we're still we're almost completing basically the impact assessment um, in the project of the 16 pilots and the program as a whole. But most of the pilots, as you can also see on the right hand side, focus on social, scientific and environmental impact rather than economic impact. Um, so that's something that, that needs to be put in perspective as well, as it doesn't really um, contribute in the same way to discussions around scale and, 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 and return on investment. In terms of economies of scales, though, um, one of the things that we would like to do or um, we would do if, if action would continue, say, for the next three years, would be to use blended learning more widely and to complement it with specialized on-demand support. So that allows us to scale, would allow us to scale to support not just 16 projects, but perhaps 160 or, or 1,600. Um, what would also help is to have standardized templates and processes. And we have some of those, we've developed some of those in the project. Um, but Little things like subgrantee agreements, like data sharing agreements, um, that really recognize the realities of citizen science pilots. Say, digital tools, everything needs to be streamlined, everything needs to be um, um, explained quite, quite, quite clearly um, and supported by a diverse team like we had in Action and, and in the other SWARPS projects. We could also experiment with alternative innovation models. Um, so something like perhaps having a standard curriculum of compulsory training delivered as self-learning as a prerequisite for applying into action-like programs, especially when funding um, is, is, is involved, which is quite costly to, 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 to implement still. Having something like that, having some sort of certification um, would, um, and it doesn't have to be something very heavyweight, but it would basically uh, give us a signal on the needs and the commitment of the citizen science um, uh, teams that we're working on. And it will also help us streamline uh, the support. And then perhaps additionally, different types of open innovation funds where we support um, a range of types of, of, of CS work in different ways, and we screen for viability as, as the pilots advance. Um, and finally, and I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost at the end, 
Um, I mentioned earlier that that I come from a slightly different field, um, and that is uh, more around open data and data-driven innovation and its societal implications. So um, if we're thinking about mainstreaming citizen science um, and the outcomes citizen science pilots produce, one of it is quintessentially data. Um, so finding and thinking about how to add value and increase the impact and use of these data sets is, at least in my personal opinion, crucial. And there's um, no doubt, you know, several other initiatives going on in, in, in Europe, supported by the European Commission, um, which are relevant to this. Say um, there are people in the um, open data and data-driven innovation community working on methodologies to identify high-value data sets across the board, including open data. Um, how do these high-value data assets look like for citizen science? Um, and you could imagine um, data that contributes to sustainable development goals and Green Deal reporting as playing perhaps a role there. Our experience is that while there has been immense progress in open science and open science tooling in Europe and the world, and um, partners like uh, the UPM in, in, in action and Oscar Korcho, who will be speaking later today, have, have played a leading role in this. The tools that we have right now, Zenodo, OpenAir, um, anything of a kind, they work well for professional scientists, um, but they still require a lot of training for to be used in citizen science data governance. In fact, my personal opinion is that we would need to um, reflect very seriously on how we design these tools if we want to make them more accessible for the public and if we want to encourage more casual human data interactions. Toolkits to monitor and assess the economic impact of, of European citizen science systematically are on their way. And finally, connections to local ecosystems and, 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 and better valorization of data to really, as I said earlier, um, have an understanding of what the impact of these data sets are and how the impact could be uh, perhaps increased. And with that, I will leave you with a lovely team in action from um, all the times when you used to meet in, in, in person, and I would be happy to take some questions, if any. Thank you very much, Elena. That was really, really interesting. And there are already some uh, questions that we will be able to address uh, possibly later on. Don't hesitate, Elena. You can uh, answer directly to people in the chat. There is quite some curiosity uh, around uh, the example that you have provided about, well, the, the, the reflections that uh, emerge from your project around um, the support, so the investment, the one to three euros uh, comment that you make. So I'm sure that you can um, address maybe some of these questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we're running a bit short uh, of time, but uh, we will also have uh, a round table pretty soon where you will be taking part. So that's where we can also address some of these questions. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, for, for your presentation. Um, I would like to uh, move on to the next uh, presentation and it is going to be from colleagues from the EU Citizen Science Project, so the other project that is hosting uh, this conference today. Uh, welcome to uh, Silke voigt hoige from the Natural History Museum in Berlin and Antonella Radicchi also from the Natural History uh, Museum in Berlin, uh, both leading the EU Citizen Science Project. Welcome on the stage. Um, so, um, Silke and Antonella will be uh, introducing us to uh, EU Citizen Science, uh, the European Knowledge Platform for Citizen Science. So, thank you, and the stage is yours. Thanks so much, Marcia, for the lovely introduction, and hi, everybody from Berlin. 
My name is Ike Vogt Heuke, and together with Antonella, I formed the coordination team for the EU Citizen Science Project. We are really, really happy to have so many participants today at the final conference of the EU Citizen Science and Action Project. And it's a pleasure to give you some insights and um, some lessons learned from the EU Citizen Science Project. So who and what is EU Citizen Science? So Marcia already gave you an introduction um, this morning. We are a CSI project, a coordination and support action project. And we are formed together of 23 European partner institutions. And together we created this amazing project. Our partners come from 14 different European countries. And um, here you can see our amazing project consortium. What you can see is that um, we got together a very wide consortium um, forming of science museums, scientific actors and society actors. Um, so we had very different insights that we took into the creation of the EU Citizen Science Project and all the pillars it was founded on. I would like to give special credits to our executive board. Um, we had in total seven core partners um, forming of um, the museum in Berlin, the MFN, AXA, um, the um, ZEI, Earthwatch, UCL, Excite, and um, um, Iversivis in Spain. And together uh, we formed seven different working packages in which uh, we lifted and raised seven different pillars of the project. So our core mission was to actually become a European reference point for citizen science through cross-networking, knowledge sharing for citizen science participants, practitioners, researchers, policymakers, and of course, also societal actors all across of Europe. And as I said, we had seven different project pillars on which our project was funded. And we started to build the EU citizen science house on those project pillars. So the first core project pillar, of course, was the platform development, um, which was the central unit of our project. And um, here, the aim was to actually present citizen science resources and trainings. And to do so, we had to find a moderation process. And this was actually uh, founded um, on a scientifically and evidence-built framework with certain quite uh, quality criteria um, that was really based on um, a very sound process that we created this. And of course, with all these efforts, we wanted to reach out to policymakers and um, wanted to give a good and sound basis for citizen science for policy. And of course, very essential was to get all these messages across and uh, we had a very sound communication and dis dissemination plan and worked on all different um, on-site and also, of course, online events um, to get our message across. And to actually see what effect our project had, uh, we had a continuous impact assessment that helped us um, to actually um, redirect and uh, to see what worked and what didn't work, and also to see um, how can these projects um, be uh, evidence-based um, uh, improved in the future. And what is really unique to our project and in a bit Antonella will tell you a bit more about is that we actually can provide an outlook into the future because our project um, will be sustainable for at least five more years. And we do have a sustainability plan that was developed with AXA and I'm really happy that Antonella can tell you a bit more about it in a minute now. And with this, I'm really happy to hand over to Antonella, who will go a bit deeper and dive deeper and tell you more about the specifics and lessons learned in our project. Thanks. Thank you very much, Silke, and uh, good morning, everyone. So in this second part of the presentation, we will have a look at the um, outcomes of our project and we will share with you some lessons we have learned along the journey. One of the most important outcomes is, of course, the EU Citizen Science Platform, which is an open access uh, uh, platform for sharing, initiating and learning citizen science in Europe. 
The platform has been uh, co-created in the past three years and uh, we have recently launched uh, it, a new version of it with a brand new look uh, interface. Here you can see um, the new homepage and you are welcome to visit us and uh, have a look at the projects and resources and materials that we have on the platform. Specifically, you can find uh, more than 400 um, projects, resources and training materials about citizen science. You can also find uh, profiles of organizations uh, who are doing nowadays uh, um, projects about citizen science. So, in other words, if you um, access the EU Citizen Science platform, you can get an understanding of what, uh, who is doing what across Europe nowadays within the, Euro within the citizen science community. You can also use the platform for um, uh, broadening your uh, network within the citizen science community. You can have a look at the events calendar. You can uh, share questions and comments within our platform and community forums. And of course, you can uh, access other platforms about citizen science that we uh, host uh, in the EU Citizen Science platform. Last but not least, you can also join the um, community of users that uh, as of today have registered on the platform and we are proud to share this impressive figure of uh, 1,500 plus uh, registered users. Another important outcome of the project is related to the citizen science trainings that we have co-developed with the uh, citizen science community and with the citizen science champions who work independently and within academic and research institutes all around the world. So via our, uh, the EU Citizen Science platform, you can access 20 training modules in uh, more than five different languages. And we are particularly proud of this achievement because in so doing, we think we can definitely favor social inclusion and uh, favor uh, the um, exploitation of these resources and training modules by uh, citizen science practitioners uh, beyond academic and university circles. For example, in the education system, like teachers or um, act, act, uh, uh, activists um, at the local, working at the local scale. Another important uh, outcome uh, of the project is the moderation framework, which we use to assess the projects and the resources that the citizen science community share uh, via the EU Citizen Science platform. This makes our platform unique because you can make sure that all the projects and resources and materials that you can find on the platform are of high quality. And this uh, quality framework is built on uh, a strong set of criteria spanning from overarching criteria to supporting criteria that are used to assess and validate the projects and resources before uh, publishing them on the platform. Just to give you a quick example, uh, we make sure that projects and resources are about citizen science, are relevant to citizen science. They are uh, properly described and uh, give a clear understanding of what the institutions or the groups are doing within the context of the projects. We also make sure that the content is open access and clearly understandable. As Silke mentioned, we have made a lot of work for uh, raising awareness about the importance of uh, citizen science for uh, different stakeholders and especially for policymakers. We have done this by uh, publishing five deliverables specifically targeting this topic. And in these five deliverables, which are of course open access on the platform, but also on our Zenodo webpage, you can find information about best practices, we, you can find uh, recommendations uh, about how to raise awareness among stakeholders uh, for using citizen science as a method, as a tool for uh, policy making. And you can also find information uh, about uh, reflective workshops that we have run in order to better understand what we mean when we say that a citizen science community is an established one. 
We think, in fact, that this is particularly important when we want to uh, help countries, community groups, cities uh, to um, make citizen science established. So in order to help these groups, we need to understand what we mean uh, with the word established. Uh, another important event that we have organized uh, along the way is this high-level policy event, which took place in June within the context of the Research and Innovation Days. We have invited representatives from the European Commission, from the Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation, from the Portuguese Ministry of Science and Technology and Higher Education, and from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. So these important stakeholders, along with other representatives from academia and the society, have discussed together challenges, but also, pot but, but also potentialities that we uh, uh, face and, uh, and uh, take advantage of when we want to use citizen science for uh, policy uh, making across Europe. And we are uh, proud to uh, share with you that we have just published a report uh, about this event where uh, we highlight the main outcomes uh, which were discussed at uh, this event. And of course, you can find this report on our platform and also um, on uh, it's another web page of the project. As Silke mentioned, we have been able to build a big uh, citizen science community around the EU citizen science platform. We have done this through many communication and dissemination actions, both online and on-site ones. Just to give you a quick example, we are uh, happy uh, that we have more than 7,000 followers our, of our social media channels, and we have uh, more than 700 subscribers to our newsletter. So we welcome you to join us uh, um, online, but also hopefully on-site uh, in the next uh, months to come for some on-site e events. Last but not least, we would like to uh, share with you some le lessons that we have learned by conducting evaluation and impact assessment exercises in the past three years. What we have um, learned is that there is a high interest in this kind of evaluation and impact assessment practices within the citizen science community. So our recommendation would be to uh, include these uh, exercises within the context of every project from the early stage of the projects themselves. It's also important that evaluation and impact assessment exercises are flexible and adaptable to different contexts and actors, as we have seen uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. To conclude an outlook into the future, we are happy to say that EU Citizen Science is now an established reference hub for knowledge sharing and community building within the citizen science community. And this is a great news and it's also a great challenge, which will be tackled by EXA in the next five years. Uh, in fact, EXA will be um, manage the platform for the next five years and we will be tackling some of the main challenges like sustaining and retaining this big community uh, that we have built in the past years but also EXA will be uh, taking care of uh, expanding the network both uh, locally, uh, regionally, nationally and internationally by means of different action just to give you an example, uh, they are going to further developing the platform's connection with other uh, citizen science platforms. A couple of uh, examples uh, of topics that could be uh, further res uh, researched and studied in the next uh, months and years to come. One is about the citizen science uh, training materials. We have uh, understood that uh, it's not uh, obvious to define what a training resources is. And I'm sure that uh, uh, we will hear more about this in the next session when uh, Moki and Claudia will be discussing uh, more uh, uh, the platform and uh, citizen science trainings that you can find there.
Another topic that uh, is important to further study is uh, this uh, concept of what a citizen science uh, established community is. As I mentioned, we, uh, may, we have made uh, some uh, work on this, but definitely uh, it's important to further, uh, you know, think and discuss uh, this uh, topic. So if you want to hear more about this, let's stay with us today and tomorrow. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Antonella and Silke, for this really interesting presentation. And as I mentioned before, we will have plenty of time in the next session to uh, discuss more about uh, the project outcomes, their legacy, and plenty of time to address the very interesting questions uh, that have uh, popped up in the chat. So thank you, Silke. Thank you, Antonella, and, and see you later. Um, so uh, we are going to smoothly head into the next session. Uh, it's always here on, on this on this stage, so uh, don't leave. Uh, we know we have you have been uh, listening to people talking for quite some time now. So in order to make sure you're fully awake for the next session, we have planned another little uh, warm up activity for you. Um, the next session is actually going to be focused on sharing knowledge for empowering citizen science, uh, and we are going to focus on uh, showcasing to you uh, the training resources, materials, uh, the huge amount of knowledge and opportunities that are available uh, on uh, the two, uh, on the platform and on the on the uh, uh, action website. Um, and this will be followed by a roundtable where we will discuss with other invited guests about the two projects, uh, legacy and how they can be sustained long term. And I also saw there were some questions about this in the comments, so we will get there uh, quite soon. But before we get there, I would actually like to play a bit more with you uh, using the chat. And I'm going to teach you how to actually make emojis appear in the chat. Um, so. Basically, uh, in order to make an emoji appear, you should type a colon and then type a word, something like an emotion or something that uh, the, 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 the system then will automatically associate an emoji to what you post there. So to give you an example, if you write colon smile, then an emoji of a smiley face will actually appear in the chat. So I would like you to use emojis to answer one question that we would like to ask you. Uh, and the question is, how comfortable do you feel with setting up and running uh, a citizen science project? If you can uh, make it work through, um, wow, I see some people, for some people, is already working quite well. Uh, so if you manage to answer to this question that just appeared here in both in the chat and on the screen about how comfortable do you feel with setting up and running a citizen science project through uh, an emoji and someone just put a cat. So I guess that's a good sign. I guess that means you're feeling quite comfortable about it. Uh, I see some screaming, uh, very scared faces. Um, a bear, I guess that's also a good sign. Uh, we will we will need um, interpretation for for animals, but I'm taking them as as a positive sign. Um, someone is feeling quite comfortable. I really love how you are using these emojis. Um, uh -huh. Feeling strong and good about it. Uh, someone is feeling. Michael, I see from your emojis that you might not feel so comfortable with setting up uh, a citizen science project. Uh, I see a tree. I take it also as a really good sign uh, that someone feeling quite comfortable about it. Ah, really nice. It, this is working really nicely. So uh, I see um, someone feeling maybe still a bit asleep. So we can. Keep going with our warm-up activities to to make it work. Uh, a roller coaster, very nice choice. Uh, that is a really nice choice for an emoji. Okay, that's looking really nice. Thank you very much. Uh, I can see this game working really nicely. So you can go ahead and keep putting 
uh, emojis in uh, in the chat. Oh no, a, a, a broken heart. I hope. <laughs> I hope that's not too too bad. Uh, okay, then uh, we also have another question for you. In this case, it's going uh, to appear in your uh, poll uh, section, um, and we would also like to ask you what is your biggest training need uh, when it comes. Uh, to citizen science. So if you click on, on poll, normally this question should be appearing there uh, and there are various options you can answer. Um, for example, how to manage volunteers, data management, communication funding. We just put a few options there, um, but please, if none of them actually represents your main training need, uh, do use the chat to let us know um, what uh, your training needs. And Lucy, thank you for clarifying. Okay, now I understand that the bed was supposed to represent being really comfortable. Sounds good. <laughs> That's perfect. I thought it was relating to the sleepy, sleepiness question we asked before. Um, so I see some people answering the poll already. Um, how to manage volunteers and funding seem to be quite two big challenges. Uh, coming up, um, if you, if your main, main training need does not appear here, uh, please don't hesitate to to click uh, to to write uh, to write it in the in the chat. As we are running a little bit short of time, uh, we're going to leave the poll open as well as the chat. You can keep posting there. Uh, and answering to the question. It will be very useful to hear from uh, your training needs as we will be talking about those uh, very soon. In the meantime, I would like to um, invite to the stage our next two speakers who are Muki Hackley from UCL London uh, and Claudia Fabocartas from the European Citizen uh, Science Association based in Berlin. Um, both Muki and Claudia are uh, involved in the U Citizen Science uh, project and uh, they have been very much involved uh, not only in the creation of the platform but especially in the creation of training materials and training models that are available there. So welcome Muki, welcome Claudia and the floor is yours to, to present all these useful training resources to us. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, um, Matia, for the introduction. Um, so as you said, Muki and I will present the platform functionalities and the training modules or MOOCs um, developed within the EU Citizen Science project. So as you now know, EU Citizen Science is an online platform for sharing knowledge, tools, training, and resources for citizen science built by the community and for the community. Antonella and Silke have already given an overview of what can be found on the platform and you can browse through your citizen science without having an account, but being registered allows you to access the training modules and Moki will talk more about this in a minute, to submit project profiles, resource profiles, etc. at events right in the forum and bookmark projects and resources that you can quickly find later safe, saved in your personal area. So there are two platform homepages. One homepage is for those that are not logged in and provides a quick overview of what the platform is about and what you can find there. Once logged in, users can see another homepage with what, what is new on the platform and the latest projects, resources, training, organizations, and platforms. There is a search bar at the top of the page where you can introduce keywords, for example, biodiversity. Direct links will appear to resources with a book, training with a graduation cap, projects with binoculars and um, keywords with a key. You can select these links directly or simply enter the keyword and look through the different sections. The content in the different sections can be filtered using parameters such as country, topic or participation tasks for projects or language, theme, category and audience for resources and training resources. Newly added is the option to search for other users and also to look for other people with similar, similar interests as you. Related to this is the newly improved personal area where you are able to open up your profile to be visible to other users and to subscribe to monthly digests that um, 
will be um, start, we will start sending out shortly. Users are able to see their submission history to easily search for and edit pre previous submissions, see what has been moderated and what is yet to be moderated, and find their bookmarks and edit their profile. Also, as Antonella mentioned, the section on platforms and networks has been added um, for the final version of the platform. This section is dedicated to citizen science platforms and networks, national, regional, or other. Um, and it has also its own submission form. Speaking of submitting content, as just mentioned, as a registered user, you are welcome to submit content to the platform. The submission forms have recently been updated and those that are longer have a button called save and continue editing. Once all mandatory data for a project or resource has been introduced, you can click on it and continue editing at a later point. Your submission, oops, your submission can always be found in your personal area and you can edit them anytime. And as Antonella and Zirke have already mentioned, the work done on the quality criteria framework within Work Package 3 led by EXA is applied in the moderation of platform content since um, high quality um, resources and, and projects um, are very important within the project. In continuing with the theme of good quality content, the UC Citizen Science Consortium has created a selection of gold star citizen science resources to help anyone get started with designing and launching their own citizen science project or simply learn about citizen science. These resources are categorized across the project life cycle, initiation, planning, execution and impact and evaluation. The static parts of the platform have been translated to the 11 languages of the consortium for the most part, and project descriptions can now be translated too. It will be gradually possible to translate other dynamic content as well, such as resource and training resource descriptions. Anyone can submit a translation by going to the bottom of a project profile, clicking on translate, selecting the language and introducing the translation of the text that appears in English on the left, and then saving. And now we see the translation in Spanish in this example. Translations appear when you set the platform language to other than English and they are um, available, obviously. And on the platform, there are also an events calendar, a blog and platform and community forums for questions in collaboration with the community. And finally, the API, which stands for Application Programming Interface of the US Citizen Science Platform, allows interoperability and connection to other platforms on which we are currently working. It almost allows everything that the platform does, that is authentication and to push, pull and edit content. In addition, the platform's code is open source and can be adopted by other platforms. And with this, you have a yeah, nice and quick overview of the platform functionalities and I'll hand it over to Muki for the part on the training modules. So, thank you very much, Claudia. The training, as Antonella mentioned a few minutes ago, we have over 20 training mod uh, modules. They are not exactly MOOCs, they are more designed to be self-standing uh, elements of an hour and a half where people can learn by themselves and do it without guidance or without a tutor, although we hope to see uh, tutors and using it for tutorials in different way. Next. So you, you access it by going to Moodle uh, at EU Citizen Science. Um, and also if you go on the platform itself and you click on MOOC, it would lead you to this part. You will, if you have already an account, you can uh, associate it with it. The two accounts are links, and then you go into the different modules. And the list is quite varied and uh, represent different values and different areas. Can we go to the next? So you can see that there is um, material that is uh, designed for beginners, for people who are really starting in the area, we even now got material in different languages uh, that we can 
uh, support and uh, provide and showing that this platform can be used to support training for places that need more uh, support and need a platform that can help in uh, teaching citizen science, but also advanced topics like, for example, open science and citizen science. So that's the overview of the platform itself. Let's now take a look at the platform. So, Claudia, you've, you've started. I start with Mother. Um, okay, I'll, I'll do the sharing, just a minute. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So what you will see now is an example of one of the courses that, that uh, was actually a joint effort by uh, XI, XI at UCL, and it demonstrates to you the value of what Moodle can, can provide. And uh, this course, for example, once you get into it and you start looking at the information, it doesn't only provide uh, information. So, for example, there is the usual introduction with a video and the information that provided on it, but also because we were thinking about a uh, journalist and other potential users, the whole course content is available um, as a PDF, so anyone who want to reuse it, like the rest of the platform, for different purposes, can uh, use it and apply it in different ways. When we get to the material itself, we've been using different capabilities that this uh, Moodle system is offering us. And as we mentioned, this is designed to allow someone to do it in their own pace. So for example, they can tag as they progress with their learning along the line. And a lot of the material is telling you exactly how long you need to dedicate to each of the tasks. And for example, with the introduction to, sit to Citizen Science for Journalists, we are starting with five stories. So for example, we can start with one of them. And that is based using the functionality that the system provides to allow for a, a slideshow. So there is a bit of information, there is an image, and there is a slide that shows you how well you are progressing. So it's giving us information, introducing us to a story, explaining a bit of background about what is weather monitoring and how it works, um, then providing a wider context, telling us the uh, different aspects of why whether monitoring is a good example of citizen science and also progress it into the digital age with different aspects. And you can see that Moodle provides you an indication of how you progress along the way. And it allows participants to, uh, and learners to progress to the next activity and to start seeing more uh, stories. As I mentioned, all the material is free to reuse. So if someone wants to take material from these courses and then use them within their own context or their own courses, they are very welcome to do so. In each of the parts, because it's about self-learning, we also provide a self-learning quiz. So for example, if we'll take the, um, the, the topic that we just looked at, we will see a set of questions and we can just drag and drop different things around and then at the end um, check how well we have done and that gives an immediate feedback to the uh, student. And finally, when uh, students go gone through the whole process, they can go through a final quiz, which is the only bit that is uh, assessed and been trialed. And then when they complete it and have a response rate of over 50, uh, they will get a badge. And in every course, we're also providing further contact details, so further information about where you can find information or that will help, particularly for journalists who are looking for information, um, and uh, further details about the, uh, the sources that were used in the course. 
at the moment you are seeing my view as the designer, which includes material that is not seen by the students themselves. But the whole structure, as you can see, is using the best practice um, in e-learning and uh, integrating it. And we got the guidance and instructions on how to do it. So anyone else who want to add more training material to the platform can do it with clear guidance on how to design high quality material. That's, and that's it from my part. So thank you. Thank you very much, Muki and Claudia for this presentation. And I think many of the training needs that have appeared uh, both in the poll and in the chat uh, are definitely in your list of training resources and training models available. So, uh, but we, we strongly invite participants to go and, and have a look and we will be able to talk about this uh, again as soon as we start the, the round table together. Uh, thank you, Muki and Claudia. And you will see there are uh, some questions in the chat. Maybe you can already start addressing them uh, directly there uh, in the chat. Um, the next talk before we go into our round table uh, is from Action Project Partners. Uh, so I would like to invite to the stage uh, Gefjun Thurmer, uh, Professor uh, at uh, Ontology Engineering Group and co-founder of Localidad and uh, Oscar Korcho, who is, no, actually it's the other way around. I'm really sorry about this. Oscar is professor uh, in ontology engineering group and co-founder of Localidad. It was a uh, two uh, Spanish slash Catalan name to be uh, from UK. Uh, and um, Gefion is a research associate at King's College London. I'm really sorry about this confusion. Uh, you will be talking to us about the Action Toolkit and Action uh, Open Knowledge Portal. So welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I just thought I'd got a spontaneous promotion there, but no such luck. Um, <laughs> so uh, we want to talk about the Action Toolkit and the Action Open Knowledge Portal and some of the resources that we have worked on over the last couple of years. And um, we want to talk about that in the context of how you start a citizen science project. What is it that you need? What is it that you do? Um, and one big part of the answer for us is the Action Toolkit, which summarizes all of the insights that we've gained in the Action Project, both from our own research, but also from experience with the wider community and from the literature that has been published. Um, the Toolkit follows the participatory science lifecycle, which is this graphic on the screen now. Um, and let me just quickly talk you through that so you understand where we're coming from. Um, we've mapped this life cycle based on our own work. It's been co-created with our pilots um, and a number of workshops with both internal and external um, citizen science projects. So we're quite confident that it, um, it reflects the way citizen science projects run typically, but then it's also adaptable. So not everything will apply to everyone and that is fine too. And the toolkit goes into more detail about what will be relevant for what type of project um, and what to look out for. So we're looking at three main areas. We're looking at problem framing, which is everything from defining what kind of topic you want to look at, why you want to look at it, who is an important to talk to about that, what, a, what the research design would look, la look, la look like. Um, then we're moving into research implementation, where we are looking at everything from um, defining the research question and defining the tasks that need to be done, um, collecting data and analyzing it all the way through to what you do with the results of that. And central to all of that is engaging with citizens. And we have quite a lot of focus on how you do that and how you motivate uh, citizens and how you can engage with different types of participants. Um, and then lastly, we talk about impact and sustainability, which is all about how you can make the project sustainable in terms of finances, but also in terms of the community um, and how you can engage with policymakers. And we will talk about uh, more about that in the um, policy masterclass that has already been mentioned earlier today. 
And what we do for each of these parts of the toolkit is we describe what the process looks like. Um, and we have some guidance around what to look out for, examples from our own work. Um, and then in addition to that generic or, or general guidance about each of these steps for e different types of projects, we talk about different tools, guidelines and recommendations, activities and case studies from both within and beyond action that visualize and, and, and help you to understand on a deeper level what these things can mean in practice, but also how you can actively, practically implement them. Um, and that is where we come to the kinds of tools that we've developed. As I said, some of the tools in the toolkit are broader use are from the wider citizen science community and also from um, the technology and innovation community. Um, and Oscar will talk us through some of the more specific um, tools that we've developed in action. If the slides move on. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't want to. There they are. OK, good. <laughs> so um, I mean, as, as Gefion has commented, the, the, the toolkit uh, consists not only of uh, the guidelines and recommendations, activities, case studies, but also there are tools, yeah, tools that can be used by those who are willing to start a citizen science project. And uh, we have detected that they had issues in understanding which were the, the, the next steps to be done, yeah, so as to really make it real. So uh, uh, as we can see over here, I mean, we have tools, uh, the ones on the left, that are coming from third parties. I mean, like uh, people uh, who have been already, I mean, in the citizen science community, tested those tools, made them available. And I mean, we didn't have to invent anything new. I mean, we, we had Sony Bears, we have Epicolet, uh, we have general purpose tools like Grafana that can be used straight away for uh, the representation of data, for the collection of data, for all those activities that are common in citizen science projects. But we also wanted to go a little bit farther in helping these uh, uh, these people uh, looking uh, to in, into creating a, a citizen science project to do things that I mean we have detected that were also problematic and for which uh, we couldn't find uh, specific tools. Elena before uh, commented about the the problem on citizen science data governance and I mean many aspects that are very difficult for um uh for people to uh, who are creating a citizen science project to to use like for instance uh the data management plans that are very common for professional scientists but they are not so common i mean or they are not so well understood for citizen scientists so we have created a tool the dmt dmt tool that allows or just has several things that are already predefined and where you just have to select a couple of uh, things, uh, make a couple of decisions on what you are going to be doing with your data in order to create the data management plan. We have also a set, uh, which is uh, another tool that we are working on. I mean, we are extending and configuring for citizen science projects where you can describe how all those elements, data, resources, code, and things alike that you are using in your citizen science project can be related all together as if it was an aggregated research object, following things that are being discussed also in the European Open Science Cloud uh, sphere. And then we have two of them that I will be commenting a little bit further, uh, which are the Open Research Data Portal and Connie. So, I mean, if you go next, uh, Gefion, if it wants to. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> okay, if not, I mean, I, I can just comment. Yeah, I mean, I didn't remember the, the order. Yeah. So, Connie, uh, the, this has been developed by uh, one of our uh, consortium members, Chefriel, uh, for the design of surveys and the execution of surveys, and all the management are associated to surveys. An interesting theme from, uh, from this uh, tool is that uh, you are just chatting. And I mean, they have already discovered, I mean, doing uh, proper studies, that uh, there are many more respondents and they are more engaged into the, the discussion when they are having uh, such a type of tool. I really recommend you to, to go uh, into the, the URL uh, that we have over there so that you can actually see how uh, we can have uh, a chat interaction uh, with, with this tool and generate surveys uh, quite easily. And I mean, we have discovered that this is a kind of a very useful tool for this type of surveys. And if we go into the next one, uh, it is the Open Research 
uh, data portal. Again, I mean, Elena already commented in, in the introduction that there are issues. I mean, on understanding how can I use Zenodo, how can I make my resources available in open air, in all those tools that are uh, done uh, in the context of the European Open Science Cloud and are, are mostly focused on a professional scientist. So our main principle over here is that well, you have a community in Action, then you have a community in Zenodo that we create uh, for the for the community, and our portal integrates those Zenodo communities all together. Adding a new community is very easy, and um, basically, I mean, technical aspects are those ones that are relatively easy to deploy. So everybody, I mean, anybody with an, a citizen science project or an incubator could actually have uh, a research data portal that makes it easier to, to actually handle uh, all these typical things that are more difficult when you are going or you are approaching uh, these uh, other general purpose professional scientist uh, tools, yeah, like uh, Zenodo or OpenAir, yeah. So uh, this is all from our side, if I'm not wrong, Jeffian. That is all, yes, yeah. just maybe a little okay. reminder from what Elena has said in her introduction this morning. We are very open to feedback on the toolkit. We are very open to suggestions for tools that could be included if there's something that you think we are missing. Um, we would love to hear from you. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gefjana and Oscar. Uh, that was really clear uh, and very inspiring. So please stay on the stage with me. And I would like to invite also uh, the other speakers, so Muki and Claudia, to join us. Uh, we are going to have a round table now where we would like to uh, address some of your questions and also try to reflect together about the legacy of all this huge richness of uh, outcomes that you just heard about. And uh, in order to do so, we have uh, two further invited guests with us. So I would like to uh, welcome uh, Sven Schade, uh, who is Scientific Policy Officer at the Joint Research Center <coughs> of the European Commission. Welcome, Sven. Um, and also Linden Farrer, uh, Policy Officer at the DG Research and Innovation of the European Commission. Welcome, Linden. So um, we are going to try and make this roundtable work online. We know it's not as easy as in a face-to-face -face environment, but I'm sure we will, we will make it work. So um, before going into some of the questions that have come up in the chat, and please do, uh, if you have further questions, please do write them in the chat or in the Q&A. Now is really the good time to exploit as much as possible uh, our colleagues who are here with us. Um, we would like to, 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 I have a first question that I've, I would like to ask you. So um, we have just heard about really a great richness of resources and capacity building opportunities and tools uh, from both projects. Um, so I would like to hear your thoughts both on uh, what do you think that would be the most useful uh, out of all these resources? What do you think would be most useful to researchers, for example, looking uh, to do citizen science for the first time? It could be the case, as we just heard from uh, Patrick this morning, there will be more and more citizen science being mainstreamed in a lot of calls. So um, we would like to hear from you. Where do you think that uh, people addressing citizen science should look uh, into uh, to start with, uh, and also in general, research institution venturing into citizen science for the first time. Uh, how do you think they can exploit the richness of what you have been developing in those projects? And as there is no raise hand or any option on this platform that can make me understand who would like to answer first to this question, I'm just going to leave it to whoever raised his or her hands first. Sven, thank you. Thank you for breaking the ice. Please go ahead. Sure, of course. Hello, and thanks for having me. And hello, everyone. Um, and I think it's it's a difficult question, eh? so don't don't ask me to choose one resource over the other, um, because all we saw it it's extremely valuable, and I'm sure it will be reused also in the future. Um, but what I wanted to start with is that we may want to distinguish between different kinds of researchers. So on the one hand, we may think about more the academics which want to understand citizen science, so they may re really need more introduction, the do's and don'ts, and some guidance how to carry out or reach out to the citizen science community. And then there is another kind of researchers which are 
citizen scientists or potential citizen scientists to be, uh, which may actually more look for solutions, uh, helping them to solve their particular questions and problems. But I think it would be worse to distinguish between different kinds of needs uh, from different communities. Uh, and one big uh, question I still see is how to make these people aware what is out there. How do these people reach the action toolkit? How do they reach the European uh, citizen science platform? So I think this is one of the, the core questions. So uh, I only answer in part, but I play also a question back to the, to the panel. Thank you very much, Sven. Linden, welcome. Yes, hello. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you. I can't believe uh, action and EU citizen science are coming to an end already. It feels uh, like yesterday that they were kicking off and really achieved so much in these, in these few years. Um, I mean, at the European Commission, we can play a part in trying to uh, ensure that the, the many good training resources and other materials are exploited to the full. Um, one thing that we're already doing is pointing uh, applicants and uh, experts in the direction of resources produced by a project. Uh, there's a Horizon Europe program guide. Um, I think you know, a lot of what's been produced is really useful there. Uh, we can't put a lot of detail in our topic texts normally, uh, but we really promote this program guide as somewhere uh, that uh, applicants who may know maybe very little about engagement, but they can find out a lot more. And the same for the expert evaluators as well. Uh, the, the action um, resource and data management plans, for instance, just sounds really useful. Um, another way that we can try and exploit this, I think, is to try and build uh, upon this work uh, in future actions. Um, and I, I think we, we can expect to see uh, projects that are focusing on integrating different aspects of open science uh, into research careers, for instance. Uh, and there it'd be really interesting to see uh, these training uh, materials, but also the learning really uh, brought into uh, training that goes uh, to a very wide range of researchers at all stages of their careers. And this is really part of the way of, of promoting open science and citizen science, engagement, uh, greater interaction, for instance, through communication uh, for all scientists. So um, maybe this helps answer another part of this uh, quite complex question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linden. Ah, I think Claudia and Gaffin, you raise your hands almost at the same time. I think Claudia was faster just by a few seconds. Uh, Claudia, please welcome and you can maybe address some of Sven's and Linden's com comments. Yes, um, thank you, Marcia. So I was thinking in terms of the platform, um, first someone has to get to the platform. That's um, also what um, Sven was raising and um, how to make people aware of the platform and also to, but this is a bigger question, how to make um, people aware of the platform that um, they don't see what they are doing as citizen science or they understand it differently. But so to answer from my side, once they come to the platform, it um, would be useful to look at the gold star selection of resources um, because the Almost 200 resources right now might be a bit overwhelming. So there's a place to start. This paired together with the training resources, uh, training modules that Muki was presenting, especially the introduction to citizen science one. And then from there, branch out, try to identify the needs and see if we have covered them in the platform. And also what um, I think many people, many users of the platform find useful is to look at other um, at projects um, how they are running them, if they are local or not, and um, similar to the topic, just to get inspired on how others are doing it. And then from there, to get to the resources of that those projects. That's from my side. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And I would also add, um, and this is a bit of a self-plug, but, but our life cycle is designed to do ex to answer exactly that question, to give people from everywhere, be they academics or, or bottom-up citizen scientists, be they project managers or be they participants, uh, an entry point into where they can start and what their next steps would be. And that is exactly what our toolkit is designed to do. Um, we are currently working with EU citizen science to try and integrate our toolkit with their platform so that it becomes more findable. Um, and I think the most important bit that happens um, and that needs to happen continuously is the integration with the community. 
large parts of the toolkit as well as our resources are co-created with the community. So, and that means A, we make sure that they're actually relevant to what the people need, but it also means that more people know about it. And the community that we have established with action and the community that EU citizen science is developing and, and continues to develop on the platform. Um, I was quite happy to see those personal profiles in Claudia's presentation earlier. Um, I think that that is a huge opportunity to just stay in touch and make sure that people have an opportunity to talk about these things. And then that can also help accelerate where the, uh, where the resources are used because people will talk and they will know about them. Thank you. The, the, the talking about legacy, you you just mentioned uh, bottom up, and and also uh, I would be interested to hear uh, how members of the community can keep having an active role uh, within action and new citizen science, also beyond the duration of the project. So, uh, if I understand correctly, they do play a key role uh, in uh, what has been produced so far and how it's being used or so beyond using these outcomes, uh, can, uh, for example, participants connected today uh, keep uh, having a, a, a very proactive role uh, in the future of these two platforms? Oscar, I uh, will, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, in, in fact, I mean, I think that, the, um, uh, for instance, Action was not coming, uh, I mean, it was not starting from scratch. I mean, it was also based on previous experiences. I mean, many of the things have been continuing working. So, so as to show, I mean, that there was already some involvement uh, before, I mean, and some previous uh, commitments. And for the future as well, I think, I mean, that um, one of the key uh, elements that, that we have been doing on connecting to existing third party resources, connecting to existing uh, things that we are promoting, like the European Open Science Cloud as well, uh, in the context of the Open Research Data Portal, are also focusing on that side yeah, of making uh, not just the effort of working on your project, you finish your project, you don't continue providing support to Action as well, I mean, or, or any other uh, initiative, but you are also uh, contributing uh, as well your resources into something that is continuously ongoing. So I think that, I mean, this idea of um, not just creating something purely from scratch, but connecting to these third party resources will make sure that, I mean, we expect that it will continue. Yeah. Thank you, Oscar. Muki, I think you also raised your hand. Yes. So, um, it's something both that, that Uta mentioned in the chat about the legacy of, of previous projects she mentioned, we observe, and it's actually a really great aspect that, that the training modules in EU citizen science are actually hosting some of the we observe material and of Grow Observatory and other projects in the past. And that's, I think, a very important aspect of EU citizen science as a place to collect information. I even will go further back like the project making sense which produce fantastic toolkits and resources that people should find and reuse or the DITOS project that created the whole set of policy brief that can still be used in in different aspects in different contexts but what i would really hope to see coming out of of the different work that was done is for people to start realizing that they can use those resources to provide training and advice locally because that's the beauty of all this information that is provided for free that actually they can design training sessions around it they can carry out activities around it and and they don't need actually permission from anyone that's the whole point about the open science and the sharing of the material so i hope to see people starting to take on board and and reusing the different material surely we will you know within the msc that we are designing at ucl we are planning to reuse different toolkits and direct students to to use this richness in different ways Thank you, Muki. I, I think it's uh, worth mentioning, uh, I think we were mentioned before also that uh, the, in the case of the U Citizen Science Platform, for example, it will be hosted and maintained by the European Citizen Science Association for the coming years. So uh, it will definitely be a place that stays alive and, and where lots of things will be 
uh, hopefully happening in the future. Um, Sven, you're back just in time. I had actually one question uh, for you and, and Linden. We, we heard this morning also from Patrick that there seem to be some quite uh, interesting um, things coming up at European level. So he spoke about campaign uh, and new calls uh, and events, etc. So I was wondering whether there is anything you would like to add in terms of any opportunity you can think of uh, that could be used to further uh, not only promote, it's not really just about promoting this, uh, the, the richness of these project outcomes, but that get them uh, known by, by the broad community, I think there will be more and more researchers uh, addressing this open, this very important open science uh, point in their proposals, in their new projects, uh, and reaching out to, to people. So if there is anything you, you would like to add to, to what Patrick mentioned this morning in terms of uh, uh, things happening in the future that you think could be good opportunities in this sense. Yes, Linden. Yes, if I, if I can come in, um, I mean, if we look at the strategy for the SWOFs, the 2018 to 2020 work program, the idea was to explore uh, in, in more depth the potentials of citizen science across all areas of, of science and innovation, uh, and to really provide a stepping stone for putting it into place in Horizon Europe. Uh, and I think one of the big opportunities that's coming up is around the missions. Um, they've only just been uh, officially announced. We've kind of known what the five areas will be, but the, the titles are there now. Uh, and if you look back uh, at the sort of philosophy behind the missions, uh, you'll see that engagement is really uh, one of the pillars. They won't succeed without a high level of engagement. And that includes citizen science in there. And at different levels, this engagement, you know, the co-design and helping uh, shape the directions that the missions move in, in terms of implementing, we can think about their citizen science or user-led innovation, uh, but we can also think about more generally sort of multi-stakeholder approaches. Uh, and then there's a, the, a kind of uh, approach called a co-assessment, which is really a, an iterative feedback to policy on, on how we're doing. So, um, you know, I think it's worth keeping an eye out on these work programs. I think there's a lot of opportunities there for citizen science. But I'd, I'd also say that even if citizen science isn't mentioned as a term in itself, uh, there's a reason for that. And that's because we want to see the very best ideas come in. Hopefully citizen science uh, is now in a position where it can very well argue uh, against other kinds of proposals, uh, taking different approaches, that it is the best way uh, to apply itself to the to the calls that we, that we launch. Uh, I think we're in that situation now. Um, of course, it remains to be seen, but uh, yeah, do keep an eye on that. I think it's a big opportunity. Thank you, Linden. Sven? Yes, uh, just to add what, what Linden already said, uh, there is, of course, also the, uh, the funding line around citizen observatories and really integrating data from citizen science with other kind of data sources uh, for environmental observations in particular, but not only, which is also going to continue. Uh, and also we saw a lot of uh, connections of citizen science work into European level and international policy, uh, which, which is continuing to happen. So one of the latest was a connection of citizen science into the forest strategy and forest biodiversity. So also there, there are more hooks in policy to support uh, citizen science activities. And not to forget to mention, there is also a series of new projects which are now starting which stem out of the highly competitive Green Deal call, but there is also now a, a set of projects which are just kicking off. Yes, thank you. And I think something nice that we could mention here and that will definitely go on beyond the duration of these two projects is that um, you citizen science together with the let's say, all the citizen science, SWAF citizen science projects, so uh, Action Mix and Cities Health has been promoting uh, regular meetings between uh, citizen science projects funded by uh, the European Commission, particularly SWAF's ones, but not only. So I think there is now, Claudia, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a group of uh, over 20 projects who regularly meet, uh, I think each month, talk together, share, uh, and there have been also some uh, 
um, annual uh, meetings that have been organized also together with the support of the RIA agency. So I think this is quite exceptional uh, in terms of collaboration between uh, EU-funded citizen science uh, initiatives, and it will definitely keep happening. Maybe also the, the Green Deal projects hopefully will, will also get on board and benefit from this exchange. Um, there is uh, an, an interesting question uh, in the chat that maybe can be our closing question for, to, for, for this morning. Uh, there is as, um, uh, Carol Paleco asking, uh, how much do we think that policymakers can uh, make use and what they can find interesting and useful to them uh, in the platforms? I would, I would say, I think this question can be directed both to you, Citizen Science and Action. I know both projects have been working uh, thoroughly on involving uh, policymakers throughout their duration through policy events, uh, masterclasses, etc. But I leave it to you um, to you um, to address this question properly. Um, maybe we can start from action. If uh, maybe Oscar and or Gefin would like to 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 address this point. Um, Oscar, did you want to or? No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Gefin. <laughs> Um, so the question was, um, what is in the tools for policymakers? Yes, um, I would say the the toolkit, the tools are probably not so relevant because they are very practice driven. Unless the policymakers are the ones who are actively trying to implement uh, citizen science projects, which is also not unheard of. Um, I would say what the toolkit enables them to do is on a deeper level understand how citizen science can work and how it can be relevant for them. But I would say that we are coming more from a perspective of the citizen scientists themselves and how for them to actively engage with policymakers and make sure that their data is up to a standard that, that it can be useful for policy, how to find out which kind of policymaker they need to engage with at, with le at which level they need to engage them how to best approach them in order to make sure that their their voices are heard and that their results can be used. So we're very much coming from the direction of, as a citizen scientist, how can you engage with policy rather than the other way around? Thank you. And I see Oscar nodding. So I totally agree with you, Gavin. Um, Muki, Claudia, would you also like to address this point from the youth citizen science point of view? Shall I go? Or? Okay. Um, okay, thanks. So um, first, I think that the, the mass of um, content we have on the platform is uh, can function as critical mass to show the importance of citizen science, the, the will of citizen science projects to put their um, profile on the platform, to, to show their work and, and show what they, they are doing. Also, um, I'm not sure how well I'm going to, to reproduce this information, but I know that um, Earthwatch in our project, um, who is um, um, leading Work Package 4 and engaging um, policymakers and um, raising awareness um, within the project, is um, working on transforming or putting the um, work they have been doing. They have um, created um, five deliverables, and um, one was recently submitted. And um, to put this content um, in a more digestible way, it's on uh, re policy recommendations towards policymakers um, and also on raising awareness um, to make this um, maybe more, more user friendly instead of having the, the long deliverable. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what I have on the spot. I could maybe add one thing from the action policy masterclasses, which is not so much a tool, but it's also something that we're very actively working on. Those masterclasses are uh, collab collaboratively with citizen science projects us and policymakers. So the policymakers are actively engaged in the discussions about how we can make citizen science more relevant for policy. And that obviously also includes what policymakers can do in order to be more open to citizen science. And that will be a topic of discussion. We are just finalizing those policy recommendations. Elena spoke about them this morning and we will speak about them a lot more tomorrow. Um, so if that is a topic you're particularly interested in, I would recommend um, coming to that session tomorrow. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Yul. And yes, definitely, if the policy uh, aspects are particularly interesting to you, then uh, do join the, the policy event that is planned for tomorrow from 2 to 4, uh, as there will be a lot of uh, talking and focusing on uh, outcomes and recommendations that can be particularly uh, useful to, to decision makers. I would like to thank very much all the panelists who have uh, joined us this morning and who are here now with me also in this round table and also all those who, who, who spoke before. Uh, please stay on the stage with me so I don't feel completely lonely here just a couple of minutes more. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that we are going to go now into the lunch break, but uh, uh, some really nice uh, youth citizen science and action partners uh, will be waiting for you, maybe are already there waiting for you in the social room. So in order to go there, just click on, oh, I'm again alone on the stage, <laughs> in order to see them uh, go to the social room. So click on sessions and go into the social room uh, where you can uh, show what you are eating if you'd like to and share with us maybe you have some secret recipes that we can uh, learn from uh, and uh, you can have a very informal it's going to be a very informal uh, session it's not moderated so you can uh, talk and chat together you can uh, also fix uh, individual appointments with participants uh, we are going to activate maybe it's already active the networking a function of hoping. So as Michael uh, has uh, showed before, you can click on networking and you will be matched with a random person. So be brave and try it out. It's really nice. Uh, and very important at 2 p.m., uh, there is going to be uh, a showcasing of all the boots that are in the expo session. So if you go there, and you go to the expo part at 2 p.m. between 2 and 3, you will be actually able to meet the people behind the projects that are showcased there and interact with them and listen directly uh, from uh, their uh, experiences. So you can click on any uh, project showcase there. It's both local and European uh, uh, projects and initiatives and training. Also, some of the training activities are represented there and you can interact directly uh, with the booth moderators. It's a really nice opportunity to, to have some more individual uh, conversations there. We are back uh, on the stage at 3 p.m. Uh, with more sessions th this afternoon. And if you are tweeting, uh, do remember, please, to use the hashtag uh, future of CS 2021. Thank you very much. Uh, and we really hope you enjoyed this first part of the conference and see you uh, in the lunch break uh, at the booths and then again at 3 p.m. here on the stage. Have a nice lunch. Bye bye. <laughs>